Hey everybody, this is Brother Frank and glad to be here with you. Um, tonight is, I think, a special program for one reason. Um, we need it. We all need it right now. It is so dangerous with what is going on in the world and the propaganda and, and what's happening to the minds of people. And myself working in technology, I see this all the time. Um, and the other week, I was just gripped by it again, that we must learn how to separate ourselves because what's being pro pushed into our minds through technology, specifically cell phones and everything else is so dangerous and it is ruining. It is the devil's direct path right into so many people's minds and we need to do something about it. I had a program years ago, some years back with Brad Huddleston. He doesn't live too far from me. Um, he's a, a wonderful man. Um, who has helped travel around the world and teaching schools and different people the dangers of this technology, what happens to children. And he keeps it real. There is no pulling punches. He's going to tell it as it is. And what happens to the brain scientifically with this dark side of technology and folks it's everywhere i encourage you do not shut this program off do not turn it away because you don't want to hear it i'm telling you, you need to listen to it because what's going to be shared with you is so important let's pray father in jesus name bless what's about to come forward and convict us lord that we need to be separated from the things of this world that so easily beset lord that we would be clear-minded, sober, and Lord, we would be prepared for these last days as we see the hour is now closing upon us quickly. I ask this in the name above every name, Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Yes, what if you, to paint a little bit of a theater of the mind for our radio audience, the cover of the book has a 13-year-old boy with a straw down on his uh, iPhone, and he is snorting. And it looks like it's cocaine, but when you look carefully, it's not actually cocaine. It's zeros and ones going up into his nose. Uh, cocaine is an extremely stimulating drug. And with uh, neuroscience now, we have technologies uh, based on the MRI. Um, many people listening to this will have had an MRI where you lay on a table and you go into the magnetic tunnel. And a doctor or a team of doctors will do a very deep body scan to look for something on a micro level in your body. Well, there's an attachment now. It's a helmet that you can put on before you go into the MRI. And this is called functional MRI, functional magnetic resonating imaging. And that helmet has little sensors attached to the scalp. And while someone is in that tunnel, the magnetic uh, tunnel, you can have people now do things in real time, all kinds of things. Now, my area of interest would be looking at the brain scans of people or studying the brain scans of people who uh, – are addicted to digital technologies. So uh, you can have people, for example, um, look at, I have video clips of people who are watching pornography and you can see the brain's reaction in real time. You can see the damage that's being done and the effect that it's having. That said, uh, when you look at the brain scans of people who have crossed over into cocaine addiction, crossed over into digital addiction, you cannot distinguish those brains. They're identical. And as it turns out, addiction is addiction. And it happens in the exact same area of the brain. Now, there are different symptoms of each addiction, uh, depending on what you're addicted to. If you're addicted to alcohol, uh, you get addicted in the uh, same area of the brain, the nucleus accumbens of the brain. Um, but you'll have cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, someone who's addicted to cocaine, uh, they might start to have paranoia. Uh, when it comes to digital addiction, there are a number of symptoms, depending on what type of content they're addicted to. But most often with digital addiction, at the top of the list would be anger, agitation, frustration, and then there's a whole host of psychoses that can happen uh, that are unique to the gamers, unique to the social media people, that sort of thing. So you can measure these things now. So the cover of the book comes from these fMRI uh, brain scans of people who have crossed over into uh, digital addiction and cocaine addiction uh, is what it is most often digital addiction is most often compared to cocaine addiction because of the extreme stimulating nature and the brain scans show this very very carefully so and there's no doubt now about the addictive uh, nature of these screens and so the line of addiction it used to be thought that technology is good for you and it's it's hyper stimulating therefore you're going to be further ahead with your uh, acuity mental acuity and your 
hand-eye coordination and all that stuff. And and a lot of that is true uh, to a certain point, but then the, the trade-off, the negatives that come with it, which you cannot separate, starts to take over and negate any good that could happen. And that happens much more quickly than we ever thought. And as the technology continues to, ve- to develop with the VR, the virtual reality goggles, and the AR, the augmented reality goggles, particularly when HoloLens uh, from Microsoft releases their goggles and it finds its way into the education system, um, you're seeing a, a compounding and an exponential increase of brain stimulation that's leading to all of this digital addiction. Now, I just threw an awful lot out at you, so I hope I'm making sense. Brad, I, you are making a lot of sense, and I want to ask Todd if I can a question just because of my um, drug addiction uh, before you move on. Brad, I was a drug addict for years. Um mm-hmm. Severely almost lost my wife. Everything was over and God saved my life in one day. What you're saying is that my drug addiction when I was on crystal meth and everything else is the exact same addiction that somebody that's addicted to pornography. Is that what you're saying? Uh, definitely saying that um, in the sense that addiction is addiction. Now, each drug, as I mentioned earlier, does carry with it various symptoms that would be different. Um, but the, the part of the brain that gets addicted uh, is the same in each of the various stimuli. So your stimuli would have been crystal meth. The stimuli for a, a millennial or a child would be a screen. And so the, the, the dopamine is the neurotransmitter that we love. That's what's actually making you feel high. It's not actually the, the crystal meth or the powder. That's the stimulant. The stimulant then generates this chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is what we're actually after. That's what's causing the pleasure to come into the brain and you need dopamine. Dopamine is not your enemy until you get too much. And once you start to get too much dopamine, the body builds up resistance. It's the natural defense mechanism just trying to protect you. And we fight that that resistance. And as we fight that resistance, it causes us to have to do more of the drug in order to penetrate the ever growing resistance. And so, for example, with an alcoholic, that alcoholic didn't start off drinking a half a case or a case of beer every day. They started off with just a couple of beers after work to relax. But as the tolerance built up, in order to achieve the same level of mania or high, that person has to keep upping the quantity. Same thing with uh, the crystal meth. You probably didn't start off with crystal meth. You probably started off with something much less potent, but then you had to graduate to that. But you were after the uh, dopamine. You are after more and more hits and shots of dopamine. So the dopamine at certain levels is what is addictive and it's what we crave. And then that resistance has to be built up. So where we are now, the digital addiction has hit us in the last eight years since about 2007 when the iPhone was first released is when it really started to spike. And of course, the education system jumped on this. It it perked up the economy quite a bit. So we now have a digitally based economy manufacturing in the U.S. at least has been moved overseas by and large. And so we've had this digital revolution. And what we did not know is just how toxic that it was to the brain. And so what I am doing, what God has asked me to do is to write about this, study about this and go speak about it. And as one reporter on one uh, news show that I was on, he did an article about me also uh, said, I probably have the toughest selling job in the world, and that is to stand in front of kids and tell them that their devices are like cocaine. And it's not a lie. It's the truth. So, uh, But God has given me tremendous favor because what I do is whatever everyone who is in ministry does. Uh, I mean, I have this secular thing that I do. The schools that I will be in will be uh, public and private and Christian, is love them. And yesterday I was with a, a, a large group. I was at a private school, and I told these guys, it was a boys' school, I said, you know, I I come here not because I'm enamored with jet lag anymore. Um, I didn't come here because I I love, you know, being away from home all this time. I came here because I love you. Um, And I make no bones about it. Uh, God has put this love in me for you, and it draws me and, and wants me to come and do this. And so even though I've got a message that is so counterculture, um, People, it's gotten to the point now where the saturation has reached a boiling point, and these kids, they come to me with these horribly frightened looks on their faces, and they'll look at me and they'll say, I'm addicted to porn. Please tell me, what am I going to do? And at first, it was fun. It starts to run its course, and then it turns into this drug addiction that you have to fuel and feed. So the negative side, yes, it's it's horrible. It's global. 
It's insidious. It's been an open doorway for the devil to gain control over an entire generation and their parents. On the other hand, people are still responding to the love of God. They're still responding to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. And so I think God is making one big push to bring us a revival before he comes to get us. Amen. Amen. That is very encouraging. Now, tell me a little bit more about these schools that are implementing the use of uh, technology so greatly. After what you told me, I'd be terrified. Just after that little snippet of what you told mm -hmm. me, I'd be terrified to let my student or my child, I don't have any kids. Sometimes I think that's a blessing in this day and age. <laughs> but if I did, I would be scared to let him have a tablet. And now in some schools, they call them state of the art. Um, there's a computer in almost every single classroom. What is this doing to the brains of the children that are going to be our doctors, our pilots, our neurosurgeons? Yes, what you what is happening? And let me be very clear about something. the The biggest part of the problem is not with the schools. So much attention is put on the schools because they're handing out the one to one laptop and tablet programs. The encouraging thing for me is the schools bring me in. They clearly see that it's not working. The grades are going down. They can't control the kids anymore when they have a device in their hands. They're actually wanting to do something about it. So, yes, there's a problem. The schools are contributing to it, and it's not good. But as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be in, a, in my third Kuro school here in South Africa on Friday. Now, Kuro School is a very state-of-the-art uh, school system here in South Africa where they've uh, the whole curricula is based on e-learning. But they're bringing me in because they want to maintain the balance. So the good the good news is they're uh, attempting to do something about it. The, the culprit is the home. We have a crop of parents, millennials, those born from 1982 and after, who uh, – globally, collectively, believe their child would never do anything bad. And so they give them the tablets. They use it as the babysitter. It's the greatest babysitter ever been invented. And what is happening, these children are being mesmerized, chemically mesmerized, and no learning is actually taking place, or very little, I should say. And then they go, they take the tablet in the bedroom. And so you have statistics now. I, I spend uh, most of my time when I'm away from home based in Australia and then I come to these other countries uh, and go back and forth between North America and, and Australia. But uh, so the same – the problems exist everywhere. And what is happening is that the, the parents will let the kids take the devices into their bedroom uh, for the phones, tablets, televisions, uh, Netflix, etc. And they close the door. The kids are occupied. They're quiet. Parents love it. And so the parents believing that the children would never look at anything bad – they end up getting porn addicted, game addicted, social media addicted. And uh, the, about 80 percent of the problem comes from the bedroom, to be perfectly honest with you. So by the time they get to school, they're already addicted. So the school ends up inadvertently contributing. And then the other thing that I would say about the schools, though, that the, the big thing that I'm trying to communicate to the schools now all over the world as I'm in schools constantly is that the education apps, the education games, it's called edutainment. Uh, is just as addictive as, say, World of Warcraft or a first-person shooter game, Call of Duty. And the perception has always been, well, um, sure, my kid, I can see that there would be problems if they're playing World of Warcraft or if they're playing these massively multiplayer uh, fantasy games. But my child just plays mathletics, or they just I just allow them to have uh, education apps. Well, the reality is, uh, once you study this in the lab and the brain science clearly shows us that the brain does not distinguish content. It, it, it has no idea what you're stimulating it with, nor does it care. It's just simply responding. So the biggest example that I could give you uh, of something that has gotten a massive grip globally on children is Minecraft. When Minecraft came out, it was touted as an education game because you have to teach the children to reason, to build blocks. It's like Legos on steroids and say so they have to think deeply. And at first, it's amazing. You'll be amazed at what these kids can do. But then the dopamine takes over and the kids are not learning anymore. They're simply addicted. And so they're, that game, as it turns out, was, was created based on dopamine and based on gambling principles uh, the same thing that happens in a casino with the flashing lights and the anticipation that people have that if I pull that lever, uh, I could win this time. I pull that lever, I could win this time. So a kid has has a game in his hand built on the exact same principle that if, he, if I take this ore 
and I hit this cube, I could get that gold. I could get that gold. And so these drips of dopamine based on that novelty of I could win is the exact same thing that a gambling addict has. And so the game developer uh, with for Minecraft now has 100 million subscribers at least now, mostly children, who are extremely addicted, just like someone who would go into a casino in Las Vegas. Um, and so we've got a problem, and yet that game has been touted as being educational. So we have a whole host of games like that as well that are simply uh, making a lot of money for a lot of companies. And my main concern is not only to help these children cognitively so that their grades go up, but to try to reach them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to cut through a massive addiction. And uh, Frank, you've been addicted. You know how hard it is uh, when you're underneath that cloud of demonic activity because you've opened yourself up. Deep inside, you know something's off. But for people to reach you until you detox is extremely difficult. And so, the, again, I keep coming back to this. The big fear is the children, the children, the children. They, 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 we don't have enough brain science to know what's going to happen to that very fragile, underdeveloped brain. And yet they're sitting there with Minecraft that is just as addictive as cocaine in a very young child. And we have schools saying this is good for them. We have parents who believe it's good for them. And what a great world we live in. Are my kids occupied? They're out of my hair. They're being educated, and now I can do what I want. And so to cut through that, we need revival, to be honest with you. We need intercessors, and I have them, thank God, because I'm not just in Christian schools. I'm in public schools. And I mean, when I speak in Microsoft mentoring schools, you're talking about being enamored with technology. Uh, but they, they've they opened their arms to me. And, um, and and I would say maybe five years ago that would have never been the case. But there's 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 been a, a boiling point. There's come a saturation point where – People are now seeking help. And so I've been doing this for 10 years in this particular topic. And in 2016, God did something that prophetically, I think, now I can't use that word in the secular realm, but you guys will know what I'm talking here. about. Yes. 2016, I was taken out of the controversial box and placed into the please come help me box. And so uh, I'm busier than ever. I've been been busy for years, about 17 years uh, internationally. And before that, it was in the U.S. But um, the people like yourself who who hear me and, and Todd hearing me at a church, which linking arms with you guys with, with the church has been great. I, I will say we're a little late to the conversation because the church in America has been so under a delusion and not wanting to offend. You know, political correctness has come in. It's It's been under a spiritualized form, but it's it's not wanting to offend people, not wanting to deal with anything that's negative. And I have a very in their eyes, a very negative message. To me, once you pass through the conviction and the negativity and people are free, to me, that's the best news in the world. Uh, but it's not always been perceived that way until 2016 when when God flipped that switch and finally, I think, just kind of forced it on the church. But we're seeing fruit. It's still daunting. It's still uh, like a tsunami. I, I describe it as a tsunami. And I feel like for 10 years I, that I've been writing about this, I've been kind of holding my little fists up trying to push back a tsunami. And uh, finally, um, well, God's always been behind it. And, you know, when you're dealing with things that are not popular, you just have to stay the course. But I'm thankful for guys like you, Divine Unity Community Church, all these churches here in South Africa, Australia, in Cambodia, all these places. Finally, the, the floodgates for me has opened, and I'm very thankful for that. Well, Brad, you know, interesting. I, I just want to confess right now, um, there was a time, you know, I was absolutely no, my children aren't going to play games like this um, because of my prior addictions, not just to, um, you know, technology or to um, drugs or to whatever it may have been in my life. If, basically, if you could be addicted to it, I've been addicted to it at one point in time in my life. But, you know, I remember when Minecraft came along. And they're playing the game upstairs here in the house. And, it, oh, it's only Minecraft. And he was always like, hey, this stuff's crazy. But no, no, it's not bad. And, and you know, Brad, I do see now that these little so-called harmless, th we think are harmless games, are really bringing our children into this new state of almost being. And, and one of the things I saw that you were talking about, if you could expand on a little bit, because I think this is the right moment, is that what this is doing to the children, you talked about the dopamine, but there's actually a numbing effect that comes along, especially for long-term gamers and other things like that, that the children, it's, it's happening to them. 
Yes, there's a medical condition that, that you're talking about. It's called anhedonia, A-N-H-E-D-O-N-I-A. And I spell that because the middle of that word is hedon, where we get our modern word hedonism, which is the constant pursuit of pleasure, the constant pursuit of pleasure, the constant pursuit of pleasure. And that's what, of course, technology is all about. People are enamored with it. It's revitalized the education system. It's revitalized. Now, it doesn't mean people are learning, but it's caused people to think that education is fun again. And notice I said fun. That's the whole hook in the whole thing. So anhedonia has been around and known about for many, many years. And it was first discovered in schizophrenics, people with major depressive disorders and severe drug addicts. And so detox centers, mental health workers are aware of this numbing effect that would take place in the brain where people would lose feeling toward their family, uh, have abnormal feelings toward things. For example, uh, compassion, empathy, uh, a lack of ability to feel other people's pain. And so people could do cruel, horrible things when they come under the influence of the drugs. And then when the technology came about, that numbing effect started to be noticed in porn addicts, pornography addicts, where people would lose interest in humans, for example, and only want to get off on anime. And guys, I'm sorry to use some of this street language, but that's just the world that we we live in now, and that's how these kids talk. And uh, so that said, the numbing effect then started to become epidemic in children, particularly children uh, whose parents use devices as babysitters. And so what anhedonia is is simply this. In the pleasure center of the brain, which is an area called the nucleus accumbens, it's approximately in the center of the brain forward just a little bit, and it is surrounded by what is called the reward circuit. And the reward circuit is called that because whenever we do pleasurable things and stimulate that area, we are rewarded with these squirts, drips of dopamine that make us feel pleasure. So when we stimulate ourselves with cocaine, it goes into the nose, it gets into the bloodstream rather quickly, it stimulates the nucleus accumbens and it squirts, uh, and also the prefrontal cortex and other areas of the brain, it squirts this dopamine into the nucleus accumbens. If someone drinks alcohol, uh, it gets into the stomach, goes into the bloodstream, migrates to the brain, stimulates the nucleus accumbens and other areas of the brain, and then dopamine goes into the nucleus accumbens. When people look at screens, our eyes are connected directly to the occipital lobes, which are in the back of the head, and it doesn't have to get into the bloodstream. It just causes an immediate reaction uh, because it's connected directly to the brain. So then dopamine squirts into the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens then gets excited and it causes us to derive a mania or a high. So we like that. Problem is the brain starts to fight back. It builds up a resistance. And as that resistance grows, the numbing grows because the goal of of the wall or the, the wall of resistance is to push out this excessive amount of dopamine and tone down all of this excessive hyperstimulation. Well, what ends up happening over a long period of time in adults or a longer period of time, it doesn't necessarily take a long time, but in adults, it's longer than children. Children, it happens very, very quickly because their brains are underdeveloped. That wall gets so big that you start to filter out most of the dopamine, and that's when you don't get the hits of mania or feel-good feelings and joy and fun and all that comes from it, and you have to up the ante. But as that wall gets super big, you blot out all of the dopamine. It becomes nearly impossible to get any in there. And under normal circumstances, your brain needs dopamine. It needs small amounts of dopamine so that you can feel pleasure. Pleasure at a sunset, pleasure at reading books. Well, now you've blocked all of it out. And so you're bored with everything except super duper hyper stimulating things. And so what anhedonia is, is when that wall of resistance has gotten very, very large in the brain, you start to lose feeling. So you end up losing feeling in children. They're bored to death with everything. They they go to grandma and granddad's house. They disappear with their tablets. They don't. And grandparents around the world are heartbroken because they're with their grandkids all the time, but they have no relationship with them. It manifests itself with uh, vacations where parents will pay lots and lots of money to go to some exotic place, and the kids have no interest in this exotic Grand Canyon. They would rather stay in the car and play on their tablets. They have anhedonia. They're bored. With less stimulating things, it has to be very, very stimulating. In its ultimate form, uh, people who have severe anhedonia where the wall has gotten really big, they lose feeling toward their family. So they spend no no time with their spouse, 
no time with their children because humans don't do it anymore. They have to stay with something, either the drug, whether it be cocaine, meth, or whatever it is, or with porn particularly. You have to migrate to some extremely vile things that you swore uh, two years ago you would never look at. I'll just only look at this kind of porn, but I'll never look at that stuff. But you find yourself totally immersed in it because you have to shock the brain to pierce that wall of resistance that is built up. So that person would have anhedonia where they just walk around numb. They don't care about their job. They don't care about anything. They only do the job because they need the money to pay their Internet bill. That's the only motivation that they have because they got to have that porn. So anhedonia is an extreme numbing. And what we are really worried about is uh, the, the it happens very rapidly in children who are playing Minecraft. And they don't want anything but Minecraft and and video games. And then the anger sets in. That's one of the, the top symptoms of the gamers or the digital addicts is this agitation and the anger. And so in the schools, for example, they will pull out an education app. And as soon as the teacher turns their back on the whole class who has an iPad at their desk, most of them have switched over to way more stimulating games than this education app. And that's an anhedonic effect because the, the low amounts of dopamine that are being generated by the more boring games is not doing it. So as soon as the teacher turns their back, they've switched over to Minecraft, which is going to generate lots of dopamine. And it's because there's a, an anhedonic wall there that's blocking out the dopamine. So in a nutshell, that's anhedonia on quite a number of levels. Well, you know, Pastor, uh, we, anhedonia, is that the reason why I pick up my phone when I'm at work, when I don't need to, <laughs> and when I'm not supposed to, just to glance at it for a second and then put it right back down like I never did it? Well, <laughs> that's actually a contributing factor that will lead to anhedonia. But the reason why you're picking it up is because the activity that you're doing when you're not looking at your phone is less stimulating than your phone, and so boredom sets in. And to overcome that boredom, you grab your phone to get a hit of dopamine to overcome the lesser amounts of dopamine that's being generated by your work activity. Man, I hope my boss isn't listening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I won't tell. Just go before God. and <laughs> You've confessed it enough, Todd. It's good. <laughs> amen, amen. Thank God for grace. Okay, now... Tell me a little bit more about this um, porn addiction and tell me a little bit more about how it's ravaging our church, um, ministers included. What can we do about it? And is it an open problem or is it a silent problem? It used to be silent, slowly becoming open. It's been in existence. When I wrote uh, the book prior to Digital Cocaine, that book uh, is called The Dark Side of Technology, and I was doing research for Chapter 11, and I, I say that because I never dreamed that that chapter on pornography would cause so much, so many problems for me um, in the church. What I was doing was research uh, regarding the porn industry, which at that time, 85% of the commercially made porn was, globally was coming out of the San Fernando Valley in California, and some of the things I was writing about um, were the things that you didn't see. Uh, I, I took the approach, uh, who are we kidding? Of course, I've seen pornography. Every man that I know has looked at porn. So I wrote from the perspective that it's a problem. And the church didn't react too well to that. Uh, they didn't want to judge. They didn't want to be harsh. They didn't want to be unloving. All those politically correct things uh, that have come into the church. And I'm like, who are you kidding? Every guy that I know is masturbating to this stuff. It's it used to be hard to get a hold of, and my goodness, now it's, it's in our house, uh, you know, because I just tend to take the approach, let's just be honest, let's be real. So when I was studying this, um, I started to write about the things that you didn't see on the porn films, like the doctors in the San Fernando Valley who were there in the periphery to give out the painkillers so that the women could endure these multiple penetrations and these extreme uh, large penises that were being inserted into every orifice of these poor girls who would come in who needed money and so they would uh, agree to do porn videos just to survive financially and they would sign contracts to say yes i agree to be gang banged and i agree to be uh, raped and uh, this could cause physical harm and i understand that and so they would sign all the legal documents they pay them a lot of money no residual royalties but a one-off fee to do these horrible things, and then what you didn't see on the film were the doctors who would sew up the anal, vaginal, 
uh, fissures that would be caused by uh, being ripped through these uh, horrible acts that were being committed to them. And I thought, man, this is this is abuse of women. And this, you know, here we are getting off on this stuff um, because the 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 fantasy is there are women who will do anything. And I mean, anything that we want them to do. And they they enjoy it. And then I realized it's a painkiller that's causing them to endure this. And it's acting that is causing them to say a director saying, give me more, give me more. And here this this is so addictive. And then people would argue, no, it's not addictive. And of course, it's addictive, but they would actually argue and debate it. Well, since we don't know that it's addictive, we can't say that. And so the lies were perpetrated throughout culture, including the church. So when I wrote that chapter on chapter 11, it was brutally raw, just like I described it to you. And I remember being on a conference call with a publisher and they were saying, Brad, we love this book. Um, all these chapters are great. We're going to make our children do all this stuff. But man, you really need to back off on this porn thing and tone that down. That's just over the top. But something inside of me, just like when I get a sermon and I know the Holy Spirit has just gripped me and I, I cannot help but say these things that God is telling me to say, I kept writing. And I, I, I took this to my pastor and I took it to my board and my pastor was like, no, don't you dare back down. Uh, if God's telling you to do that, this is the truth. And so my whole attitude became, why don't we tell the truth for a change? Because there's only one thing that's going to free people. Uh, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So the pornography issue for me goes back 10 years and I was screaming at the church, but the church wanted nothing to do with it. And by that time, the seeker friendly movement had come in and caused everything to be so sanitized. And uh, nobody wanted to uh, tarnish the squeaky clean image. And then when you look at the videos of Africa and you see the revival that's rolling throughout some of the countries on this continent, uh, you're thinking, what's the difference? Well, they don't have technology here, and we have technology at home. They're growing here, and we're losing people, but yet we don't know it. And we think by, uh, you know, squeak, being squeaky clean and making everything polished and welcoming our seekers and, you know, cherry-picking verses and saving the hard verses for the home groups and all that sort of stuff that kind of crept in. The pornography problem just ro rolled in like a tsunami. The enemy used that to get the church addicted. So now what we're dealing with are hard numbers, like 68% of the men in American evangelical churches are, are addicted to porn. Another statistic that, that, that came out from the Barner Research Group that was hired by Proven Men, which is another organization that I work with from time to time, 77% of men in evangelical churches between the ages of 18 and 34 are struggling with porn on at least a monthly basis. But the 68 percent bothers me because that's an ongoing basis. And so we neglected talking about it because it was controversial or it might uh, lead children into porn. And yet the children had uh, phones in their bedroom already addicted to porn. But we didn't want to talk about it because we may introduce them to porn. And so here I am sitting here knowing this driving me out of my mind. And finally, though, God in 2016 just stopped all of that. And now I've got pretty much carte blanche to talk about it. But the anhedonic effect with porn has come in, the vileness of opening ourselves up to this drug and the enemy coming in and, and seizing a demonic control on so many people where now deliverance is needed. And half the church doesn't believe in deliverance because they're, you know, we argue about doctrine still over cessationism and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's, it's a quagmire that we're in and psychology is helpful, but, and I deal in those circles a lot, as you know, but uh, at the end of the day, Jesus is the only thing that's going to free people from this mess. And we need to let him come in with his full power and yet keep it within the boundaries of scripture. Um, because we also live in that time period prophetically where people would refuse to endure sound doctrine. So there's a lot of these shows on prophecy that I'm just going to be honest with you are just strange because people don't keep it within the boundaries of Scripture. And I'm hesitant to talk on them. Um, and I, hopefully I'm not offending you guys because obviously uh, I checked you out before I agreed to do this. And knowing Marty and different ones, I made sure the coast was clear. And I'm more than happy to come on and do this. So the pornography problem in the children, we're now seeing, I was in North Carolina in a public school about a month and a half ago, and I take polls everywhere I go. So I'm in these auditoriums with all these kids, and I was speaking to grades 
uh, three, four, and five, and I ask the three, four, and fives, how many of you have an internet-connected phone that your parents let you keep in your bedroom overnight? And in the third graders, it was 65% approximately. When I looked at the photograph, I have people photograph this at the back so I can get a more accurate count. Um, So we're now seeing porn on phones uh, commonly in the third grade when they have a phone. And now you're seeing massive amounts who have tablets and phones in their bedroom. And so there's no sign of abating. It's, It's getting out of control in their millennial parents still say to us, even when I work with law enforcement, look, my kids are good. I appreciate what you're doing. What you're saying is true, but thankfully my kid's a good kid and would never do it. And so that's the biggest hurdle that we have to try to get over. Well, Brad, I, I tell you, is it? I don't know if it's just me, but it seems like the children today, I, I would be terrified to be a kid growing up today. Um, you know, I can remember the pressures. I'm only 43, but I can remember the pressures we had. I can remember the first time, you know, finding a dirty magazine. We thought that was like somebody had a nuclear weapon. Okay. I I remember, and you would like be so secretive to even show somebody like a quick glimpse of it. And now it's everywhere. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, and, and I feel like the kids today are bombarded and, and the difficulties, um, to deal with this are, are something like we've never known as us older adults. We don't understand what they're dealing with. Brent, the parents are really struggling. Um, and you mentioned though about not having the phones for parents. What, what do you think is the best thing you could give for some, an advice as a parent to, to take an immediate action with their children? The first thing I would say to a parent is stop being their friend and be their parent. Amen. God did not call parents to be friends You can do that later when they moved out. Right now, they need a guardian. And now we we use that word. We've used that word for a long time, but we've we've let it lose its meaning. We need to guard. And we need to parent. And we need to train. We need to raise up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and not the culture. So stop being their friend. Be kind to them. Don't abuse them. I'm not saying to be the opposite of a friend. I'm saying be their parent. And the the Christian model for parenting, uh, get the belt out and beat their little behinds and when they need it. Now, you guys are probably smiling, but and the reason why is because nobody says it anymore. They're afraid to. And yet the scripture is replete with verses about spanking, not abuse. I agree. But spanking. And and not every kid needs to be spanked. There are some kids you can talk to, just talk to them and they cry. They're sensitive. And then there's kids like me uh, who needed it. And, and I'm sitting here uh, spewing all of this stuff in the name of the Lord because I love him because I was disciplined properly. And and I'm thankful for that. So that would be the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say, everyone in the home, because 80 percent of the porn problem, the video game problem, the social media problem that leads to the anhedonia and the extreme addictions that are just like cocaine, about 80 percent of it happens in the bedroom. The second thing I would say is get every single bit of technology out of everybody's bedroom and sleep. Teenagers are averaging four to six hours of sleep. I've got sleep monitoring from some children um, age 13 is averaging three to four hours a night. Um, and so that leads to a whole host of psychoses. But more importantly, what are they doing during those waking hours in the middle of the night? They're looking at porn, they're doing social media, and they're texting and they're masturbating. And they're doing all this sort of stuff with parents who are asleep who don't believe their kids would be doing that sort of thing. So get the technology out of the bedroom. And that's a good starting place because the scales of balance will tip immediately in your favor. When you just take the technology out of the bedroom and make everybody go to bed at a very early hour and sleep during the night. And 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 I say that all over the world. And I got to be honest with you guys, uh, even though that's the first most practical thing that you can do that involves no psychology, it involves no counseling, it involves no fees for counseling. It's just a freebie that is the most effective thing that you can do to start the process. I probably have less than a quarter of a percent globally of parents who actually do that probably far less than that. And so sometimes I think to myself, I'm right in the middle of another big research project called Digital Rehab, where we're introducing the concept that Asia is very familiar with, and it's detoxing people, um, trying to introduce that to the West. And um, I think, man, if I can't, if I can't get parents to just 
take the technology out of their bedrooms and out of the bedrooms of their children where 80% of these problems are occurring in the brain, why should I go on this big, massive global trek to do this research project, write another book, um, and do all this sort of stuff? But then the Holy Spirit shows up, puts his arms around me and says, because I said so. And I go, yeah, okay. Thank you, Jesus, for that that encouragement. So then I keep going. Um but that's that's a starting point, guys. Parenting, guardian, being a guardian rather, and then taking the the technology out of the bedroom, and then we can talk about detoxing um, and the other practical things that you have to do. The schools are 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 well on board with me, helping them to to balance out the school systems. Not all of them. Some of them don't like me, but most of them do. That's why I'm so busy running around the planet and around the U.S. Um, but we have a long way to go in the church, which is the, guys, is the ultimate cure. And I say that because the only real staying power after you do the practical, his name is Jesus. And we have got to introduce people to the power of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Brad, uh, thank you for that. And because I know parents, this is a big burden on their hearts, uh, you know, about their children and, and folks, it's okay to be their parent first and foremost and, and, and to stand up. You've got to do it. It's our responsibility to neglect it, uh, would be to fail in what God has called us to do. And that's to bring our children up in the ways of the Lord. And, and look, the thing is, you can't change what you did in the past, but you can change what you do in the future. And that's the important thing is that we start from today making a change toward the way we, we treat this technology with our children and, and also parents. And, and I say this to myself and, and Todd, I know, and I, you know, even uh, we need to be the example as the parents um, and not to, you know, do as I say and not as I do, but to actually do as I say and do as I do. Because this is what we're doing, and set that example. And it, what I wanted to ask you, though, Brad, is have you heard much cry out? You know, we talked about the churches, but are the pastors crying out and saying, please help us with these problems? Uh, is this is this something that you're being contacted more now by churches? Well, I've always been contacted by churches. The issue is not very many. Um, the pastors, especially in the early days, um, were wanting to know, uh, how I'm, how are you going to word this? One pastor asked me, uh, like, well, I'm going to use English, but you know what they're saying. Um, be sure to choose words carefully. Well, by the time you don't say anything, nobody gets it. And that's what they're, that's my, that's my argument back. But I would play the game because otherwise I wouldn't have had a platform. And guys, I hope you don't mind me being real. I mean, what you're hearing from me is what you get. Uh, I am this way everywhere I go. Um, I've got issues with the church, not Jesus, but how we've mishandled his word and and how we've mishandled, you know, taking care of the flock. And and because I'm one of the flock, I'm just I'm down on the ground. I've seen uh, I've had porn issues in the early days. And thankfully, I had a group of friends around me who were real and I could go to them and, and be accountable, be accountable to them, them to me. And 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 just trying to get that message means you have to acknowledge there's a problem. And that's what the pastors were, were by and large, not all, not all, but by and large, um, scared of. Well, that's all changed in 2016, as I mentioned before. So that's kind of an, of an elaboration of what I was saying. Prior to 2016, it was a real uphill climb. But yes, in 2016, I was taken out of that controversial box because all this has bubbled up and it's spilled over now. It's, it's undeniable. And so the, the pastors are now very, very open. And I wouldn't say I'm any busier because I was, uh, there was a lull uh, in the early days when I wrote The Dark Side of Technology where I was very busy when I first wrote the book. And then uh, it created so much of a stir because I dealt with it so bluntly that uh, people don't often like to face their sins. And so I became controversial. That's how you get rid of someone who's uh, speaking things that they don't want to hear. You just label them controversial. But all that's changed now. So, yes, I'm seeing an uptick in the past. I got, for example, one of the churches that I'm going to next uh, in about two weeks here in South Africa, pretty big church. Um, they The pastor started reading my book and he watched the DVD and he sent me an email yesterday saying, hey, can we add a Saturday session where I gather the school administrators and the teachers from our region and and open it up to the educators. And we do a special seminar for them on a Saturday. And I'm like, well, sure. Amen. So that has happened, and, and I'm very thankful for that. But it's it's been an uphill battle. 
Amen. Amen. The Lord is moving powerfully. Hey, listen, you know what? I hate to do this. We've, we've got to wrap it up here. And I'm going to ask you, um, Brother Brad, we're all part of the church. Um, all of those under the sound of my voice uh, who believe in Jesus and believe in the cross, we're all part of the church. Denominations aside, we're all part of the bride. Now, judgment starts at the church. Mm -hmm. What do I have to do as an individual in this body in order to, I've fallen prey to the snares of the devil. And besides calling upon the healing power of the Holy Spirit, what can I do to start to heal again from my abuse of this digital technology? And what can I do also to safeguard myself, just some practical steps that I can take and others under the sound of my voice can take to uh, guard themselves and their loved ones from falling uh, prey to these snares. I appreciate that so much, Todd. I'm going to say to you what I say to my audiences all over the world. Um, I'm going to say what I say to the parents and what I say when I talk about pornography. When I come out of the gate like I did here and I'm just – brutally honest about the brain scans and I show them when I'm in an audience, when I can speak publicly, I actually show the animations and all that. It, it, it is shocking to parents. Absolutely. Almost. Um, it just puts them on overload, but here's what I say to the parents. I say, parents, listen to me very carefully. God did not bring me here and cause our paths to cross for me to condemn you. It's not why I'm here. We have all, fallen into this, myself included. I have a degree in computer science. I have had anhedonia. It's such a bad level that I had to withdraw from ministry for a season to recover. Um, to the porn addicts and the, the men's meetings that I speak at, and now women's meetings because they struggle with porn as well, I say this. I found myself when the internet first introduced media, started off as just text. When they first started adding photographs, I found myself as a minister of the gospel sitting down uh, in front of the computer, masturbating and lusting. Half of me was loving it. The other half was feeling horribly, horribly guilty. And what I did uh, as a minister of the gospel, I went to a group of ministers. Hardest thing I ever did. I had to admit I was doing it, and I confessed my sins. And so I'm not guilty. I mean, I'm not innocent. I am very guilty. I'm guilty on both levels when I speak to parents. I'm very guilty. And so what I want to simply do is offer to you the same grace that was given to me. I could not bypass the repentance. I had to admit it. I, you cannot skirt that. And, and that seems so harsh, but I had to admit I had a problem and I had to go to, to, my, to God first. He's the mediator between God and man. And then the Bible says, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. And that's for accountability purposes. And when I did that with the pornography, I, I found that my minister friends, some of them were also struggling. But when I when I confessed it, the power of that darkness broke over my life. Now, it doesn't mean that the images that I saw left me immediately because they didn't. I still had residual fallout that I then had to deal with. But the power of it broke. And because I confessed it, because I made myself accountable, because I quit. Jesus said, go and sin no more because I quit. Didn't mean I didn't have struggles from time to time, but because I was not a, no longer a regular um, God's grace came on me and let me keep moving forward as a sinner because I wasn't flawless and perfect, but I was doing something about it and not just justifying my use. And so to the parents, I would say, God would say to you, there is no such thing as a perfect parent. Um, nobody's got this thing figured out. And, and, and I fully get why you use the devices as babysitters. You didn't mean to. We've all fallen into this, but now that you know the truth, it's time to start taking these evasive actions with God's help, not beat yourself up, but receive the grace of God, receive the encouragement. The Bible says to encourage others with the same encouragement that you've received, and that's exactly what I've come here to do, is to encourage you with the same encouragement that I received when I fell into these horrible sins. So I encourage you tonight, repent. Hit the reset button called grace, turn around and walk toward God, and God will then treat you as though you never made a parenting mistake. Now you have, but he won't treat you 
as though you did, because the Bible says God does not treat us as our sins deserve. To the porn addicts, I say the exact same thing. I have been very transparent about my own sins, not because I enjoy telling you that I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed of it, and I don't like to relive it. But if it will help you, there you go. I did it. But I also will tell you I stopped, and now I keep moving forward, and that's what I'm encouraging you to do. Stop it. Get the accountability that you need. Turn around. Walk toward God, and you're not perfect, but because you're doing something about it, the grace of God which by biblical definition, the grace of God is the power of God to help you do what he's asked you to do. The grace of God will come on you and you get to keep moving forward. So I come out of the gate with this science, uh, being brutally honest about it. I know it's shocking, but usually uh, I only have in a pulpit maybe 22 minutes to do my thing and another three minutes to pray and all that sort of stuff. I have to come out of the gate swinging. Otherwise, I, I can't just ease you into it because the pastors don't give me a whole lot of time to do that. Now, I don't say that from behind their pulpit, but that's why I do this. And I would just say, come to God, come to the body of Christ, but let's then link arms after we've repented and let's strengthen one another on an ongoing basis and help each other figure this out in our parenting. I am on a journey right now with this digital rehab to figure out how to detox and then maintain in the long term. Let's all link arms. Let's support each other. Let's get the grace of God, which is the power of God, to forgive us, be free inside so that we're not living and wallowing in the condemnation of the bad stuff that we've done in the past. Let's move forward. And that's what the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ provides for every single sin. Our parenting mistakes and sins, our addiction sins, Let's just be renewed, be revived, and do whatever it takes to clear out all this mess, to restore the intimacy with us, and then pass that into our children and a deep love for the Word of God. Amen. Brad, that's powerful. I, I'm going to ask Brad here, I'm going to just say, mention something and ask that you could close us out with some prayer. Folks, I know that there's struggles, and there's those struggles you feel like you just cannot overcome. And, and folks, I'll tell you right now, as a person who's been addicted to everything under the sun, uh, just name it. I've been addicted to it. Ask anybody that knows me, uh, has known about what I've been through in life, um, and I understand what it feels like to be trapped. But I also know the promises of God and what it means to cry out. And when you cry out to God and when you lay your heart out in an open way and you are willing to confess and, and folks, and maybe fast and pray and, and anything, when you are honest before God, he is able to come down. But until, as Brad was saying, until we will open up and be true. I remember in the book of Jeremiah, Brad, that God said, only confess thine iniquity. It was like, he's like, I know you're doing it. Just come clean with me. And then God promises to bring healing back when we will be open and honest with him. And folks, he is in the business of breaking bondage and setting the captives free. And Brad, I just want to say thank you uh, for coming on tonight and speaking a, a very honest, uh, very difficult, some of the things to hear, but very true word that you've delivered. And Brad, could you close us out and just ask God to just work a miracle for the people that are struggling right now, that are listening to this show? Uh, they need deliverance. And Brad, could you just pray that for us? be happy to do that. Happy to do that. Let's pray. Father, um, I know that you have caused people to listen to this. You have sovereignly put it in their lap. You do this all the time because you love us. I'm asking that the sweet, precious anointing of the Holy Spirit will come upon every single person who's listening to this, that you've directed to hear this. And Lord, start to percolate something in them that says, yes, I, I want this freedom. It's time for me to, to, it's time for me to stop this gaming. It's time for me to stop this porn. It's time for me to be a parent. It's time for me to be intimate again. Lord, I'm praying for some of those who are listening who are a little bit older, and they, they are now recalling those times when, just like in their social media, where they get completely lost and said they would check their status for 10 minutes, and an hour and 10 minutes has gone by, and they have no idea where it went. Lord, remind them right now in this moment of how they used to get caught up with you and your word just like that and lose all perception of time. And do that now by a miracle, Jesus, and use that 
to draw them back into intimacy with you and to lose the intimacy with the culture and the devices that's bringing the world right into our homes. Lord, bring a renewal and your breath in this moment where they remember those times when they were reading A.W. Tozer and they were reading C.S. Lewis and they were reading your word and they just, they hated the thought of having to go to work. They hated the thought of having to put it down because they had somewhere to be. Bring them back to those moments, Lord God, where they were way more enamored with your saints and you and your word than they were with this culture and their devices and their porn. And and Lord, I pray the same for me. You're doing that in my life and have been doing that. And I just want to see it spread in this moment. Father, for the for the porn addict under the sound of our voices right now who has this notion that they have gone so far into these subgenres of porn that are so dark and so vile and they've masturbated to things that if if somebody knew they would they, they would reject them on the dirty factor alone. God for that one right now, breathe Holy Spirit. Breathe grace. Breathe life. Let them know that we are here doing this radio show for them. And you designed it for them, not us. Lord, bring a restoration over parents who've heard this and they've known all along that something was off. Their eyes have been opened. Now this horrible condemnation is is knocking at their conscience. Father, remind them in this moment by the power of the Holy Spirit that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Holy Spirit, only you can do this. Let the power of your word and that verse I just prayed over them, that promise that is yes and amen that I just prayed over them. Let it free that parent and cause them in this moment to get excited all over again about being a parent. The reason they had these children to begin with. Lord, let it be a brand new mission field for them. Or in some, it'll rekindle that mission field where they've fallen into the technology trap. They used to have this vision of raising their children. They've fallen into it. Take that condemnation away. And renew the passion to raise those children in the nurture and the admonition of Jesus. Lord, I pray for my friends here, Frank and Todd, that you'll watch over them and cover them with your blood as they're on the front lines of battle. They've now allowed me to bring my battle to to their audience. It's, this stuff is, is demonic. It's It's powerful. But we say right now in this moment, and I proclaim this promise over these two men, that greater is he who is in us than he that is in this world. So, Lord, let this healing virtue continue to flow after we say our amens and goodbyes uh, tonight. And let it happen over this audience where the joy of the Lord now becomes their strength. And all of the sins are washed away and they know it. And they're grateful. And they go tell others what they've heard here tonight. Most importantly, they tell people what you've done in their heart. And it's in Jesus' matchless and mighty name that I pray this over this audience. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Brad, we have been blessed abundantly. Folks, you might need to re-listen to this program again, but trust, trust in the Lord Jesus. He is able and willing to deliver. Brad, may God bless you in everything that you do and keep you and prosper you through this to continue to take this message to a dying world and revive and save our youth while we still have time, Brad. And just thank you so much for that. And with this, this is Brother Frank and Brother Todd and Brother Brad Huddleston saying good night and shalom. Shalom. Lord, trumpet in Zion, sounding.